I'm a little uh, tired this afternoon. It's my own fault. Uh, my plan was to fly off yesterday and uh, get a good night of rest and uh, be ready to go. But I have a grandson. He's in sixth grade and he's playing football this year for the very first time that he's ever played football in his life. And last week he played his first game. And I was down in uh, Alabama preaching, so I had to miss it. And uh, I leave, as Keith's already mentioned, on a, about a month long trip. They play six games, and the only game I could see would be if I saw him play yesterday. And so yesterday uh, evening, about five o'clock, I went to the ball game. Uh, they got beat 46 to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> he got in the last two plays. <laughs> but you were there. But I was there. I took him for pizza after. And he said, I almost got, on a, got in on a fumble recovery. The second to last play, the guy fumbled. He almost, I said, you did really good. He has not a clue. He can tell you everything in the world about football, but he's a rookie as he can be at it. And uh, But I'm proud of my grandson. I love him and thankful for him. And so I got to be with him. And see that one, see those two plays that he played. Those the only two plays. also get to see him play this year. But, uh, so I had to get up this morning, got to get up this morning about 4.15 to head up this way. And again, I'm delighted to be here and excited because this is the third time we have done this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told my wife over a month ago that we were coming, I was coming back, that Keith was coming as well. And I said, uh, I, I, I told them everything I know to tell them about church growth. I said, it's basically this. Uh, Teach, baptize, teach, repeat. I'm done. Okay? That's it. That's how the church grows. But, uh, Brother Bill, thank you for having us. I, I have five lessons that I will present uh, today and tomorrow. And there are five lessons that I have never presented before. Five new lessons. So good luck. And your guinea pigs. If they go well, I'm not presuming. I'm especially excited about the two tomorrow morning. I wanted to present one of them now, but the two go together, and by tomorrow morning, you would have forgotten everything I said now. So I'm going to present this one that I'm really, really excited about. 1 Timothy chapter 6. What a rich, rich book. Timothy is, what a rich, rich chapter, chapter 6 is. He talks about the love of money, talks about how it can lead people astray, and how people can fall into dangerous places because of it. But then he says in verse 17, you ready? What's the first word? Charge. Charge. Command. 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 Charge. Instruct. Anybody got anything different? ESV, I know the, the New American Standard Version is instruct. Anybody get any different? All right. It's, it's as. As, as for the rich. As for the rich. For the rich. <laughs> Just yes. cuts right to it, right? <laughs> They're not going to listen to you anyway, probably. Yeah, who's rich? Well, they did a study a while back, and they found that we believe that everybody believes that anybody who makes 30% more than they make is rich. So we always think everybody else is rich. In your highest paying role you have, if somebody had told you what you're making right now, that you would someday be making that amount of money, you would have thought, man, I'll be rich. <laughs> Keith, what are you making your first preaching job? Go back to... Uh... 1979, probably about 15,000. 15? Yeah. And, and, uh, and if somebody had told you that what you made your last year at Hendersonville, that you never made that much money, you would have said, I'd be rich. But you didn't think you are rich when you made it. We think somebody else is rich. My first preaching job, I made $150 a week. And uh, after a couple of years, I went to the leaders and I said, I wonder if I could maybe make a little more. And 
And one of the elders said, Brother Pharaoh Sin, what a great name for an elder, Brother Pharaoh Sin said to me, if a boy can't live off under fifty dollars a week, he ain't worth shooting. <laughs> he owned three companies. <laughs> oh, he saw that intro. I started, I started to say to him, let's just change roles. That, that church had a philosophy. They thought the preacher should make one dollar less than the lowest paid adult male in the congregation. They said we could relate to everybody. And I said, no, let's do this different. Pay me one dollar more than the highest paid guy. And then I can relate all the way up to down. This one all the way to the lowest paid guy. We think our boss is rich. We're rich. We're rich. I was in Russia and we had a question answer time. We answered Bible questions. One of the questions was, uh, after, you know, I said, you can ask anything. So I wanted to ask about America. This is 1992. One of the guys said, uh, I understand that America, that your dogs have their own houses they live in. And that your cars have their own houses they live in. And I said, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> We're rich, aren't we? You have a job where they pay you a week or maybe two or maybe more. They pay you not to work. All about that. They pay you not to work. And you always say pay you more not to work, right? We call it vacation. You, you take perfectly good drinking water, right? Perfectly good drinking water, and you spray it on your grass so your grass will grow so you can cut your grass. You ever thought about it? Water that most of the world would be happy they could get to drink. We put it on our grass. We're rich, right? Rich people. Charge them that are rich. And as horrible as it is, most of us still equate success with money. I'm going to tell a story here that's too long a story. But, uh, and you can not have me back for telling too long a story if you decide not to do that. I'll understand. Because I don't think a preacher can tell a story this long. But I've got a point. <laughs> we'll call him Bob. That's not his name. That confused me. We'll call him Bob. I met Bob in 1997. He was building a, a statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest in advance on his horse. I was going to sit on the interstate, sit just off the interstate. The statue was 20 feet tall and going to be covered with bronze. And he commissioned one of the number one artists in Tennessee to design this sculpture. Some of you may know, most of you don't know, Nathan Bedford Forrest, not only was a Confederate hero of that conflict, he also is the one who founded the KKK. Bob said, uh, Brother Dale, we're going to have a ceremony to, uh, to uh, unveil the sculpture. And uh, we'd like for you to come and lead the prayer at that ceremony. He said, there's going to be a lot of people. The news crews will be there from all the stations in Nashville. There'll be, there'll be a, a, a pub, a politicians there. He said the the, the uh, the Grand Knight of the KKK will be there. <laughs> I thought, ain't no way I'd be going up for that. <laughs> so I called my elders. I said, Could, is there somewhere I need to be on that day? They said, yes, you need to go to New York and visit a missionary up there. So I flew up to New York and I called the guy back. I called Bob back and I said, Bob, I can't go. Bob was an interesting character. His great granddad had written a couple of commentaries that ended up in the Gospel Advocate series. Uh, he was wealthy. His great granddad had started putting in the 1900s, early 1900s, 1904, 1905, $1,000 a month into the stock market to give to his offspring. His, he only had one child, and then his child only had two children. And so when Bob, became, uh, when he turned 21 years old, he was put on the board of uh, Holiday Inn International, Harrods International, youngest board member that I have. He was the top
top stock owner for Enterprise Rental Car. He owns 64 TV and radio stations, over a thousand pieces of rental property in Davidson County. He was worth over two billion dollars. <coughs> the stories I could tell you about this man are legendary. He would he would write a check every Sunday and put it in the club for zero dollars and zero cents. Because he did not want the elders to believe that he was giving in cash. He wanted them to know he didn't like what they were doing. And he, he, that was his way of objecting. He gave them zero dollars and zero cents every week. He would sit in the foyer during service. And if anybody came in, he would interrogate them if they came in late on why they were late. And uh, then he would sit them to the balcony because they didn't need to disrupt the service. One of the elders went to him. He called the elders the Sanhedrin. One of the elders went to him and said, Brother, that's rather intimidating. We don't think you should do that anymore. And the next Sunday, he came wearing a name tag that said, Bob the Intimidator. <laughs> he was an interesting character. Um, he would call me. He would call me. He'd say, uh, I'd answer the phone. He'd say, uh, who is this? I said, well, you called me, Brother Bob. He said, well, I thought, I just want to make sure I had not change your number. I said, okay. Um, during the uh, Katrina event, he told me he was losing $19 million in revenue from the casinos a month. $19 million a month. He called uh, Milton Sewell up, President Fried Hardiman said, I want to give the school $76 million. Or any of you who know Milton Sewell, though, he kind of got excited about that. But Milton called me and said, well, can, he, can he do that? I said, I, I think he can. He said, well, well, great. I said, but you better be careful because they'll want to control what he does. And he said, okay. He never gave the school any money. <laughs> <laughs> he is a character. He used words I didn't like. He could count every week by the number of cars in the parking lot. He could tell you within 10 people how many were in the worship service. And he would call and challenge the secretary every Monday morning. Uh, he was not an easy man to get along with. But he's rich, very successful, and if you have money, you know, people follow you around. So he had his cronies, people who wanted to know everything he did, whatever he asked of them, they, they would do. He got old. He got old. And he had no children. Never married. He dated a girl, a lady. His mom died. I did the funeral. I didn't make you do it, funeral keep. I went to the Woodline Funeral Home there in Nashville. Showed up an hour early so that when the family arrived, I could be there if, if needed. Not be in the way, but if needed. So I stood over in the corner and after uh, about an hour before the, the uh, visitation was to begin, side door opened and he came through and there was a woman with him and she had a bag over her head. And uh, he, he said, uh, he introduced her to me, this was the lady he was dating. And he said, uh, it's all right, you can take the bag off your head now. And he didn't want anybody to see her or know who she was. It was an odd, odd man. All the stories I can tell you about Bill. About Bob. Is Bob still living? So, you had the story, Keith. My question answer time. Story time. So, just to hear. So uh, he got old. He ended up in a nursing home. I didn't know it. I'd left the church while I was preaching at that time and go preach to another church. And I got a phone call one day from one of his uh, cronies, Brother Rob. Rob said, uh, Bob's uh, nephew, only living relative, I guess, he had. And, said that he put him in the put him in the nursing home. And Bob's not happy about it. But he's only asked to see one person. He asked to see you. I wasn't the preacher there anymore, but I thought that's kind of neat. I think I'll go see him. Listen to him talk for a while. I went to see him. Before I went, I decided this man's worth two billion dollars. He had willed all his money to the sons of the daughters of the Confederacy. 
And at some point, they took their name off their building on Vanderbilt's campus, and he tore up his will. Two billion dollars. Not going to give it to the church. Some of you know I do a thing called the Jenkins Institute. We need money sometimes. So I thought, you know, I think I'll ask Bill for a million dollars. I mean, if you have two billion dollars, what's a million dollars, right? I mean, that's not much. I'll ask him for a million dollars. I'm going to go see him. He, I'm the only preacher that asks him to come see him. I, he'll do that. Not even blink twice. By the time I got there, it was, I decided I was going to ask him for 10 million. Because, you know, <laughs> he's not going to have anywhere to give it anyway, so I might as well ask for 10 million. So I went to see him. He had gotten blind, barely could see. He went on and on for about an hour. I just listened, nodded, agreed, disagreed, talked to him, listened to him talk. He began to wind down finally. And I was getting the nerve up past him. About that time, the door opened his room. His nephew put him in the nursing home and came in. And I thought it wouldn't be appropriate to ask him. I'll come back another day. So we prayed and I left. About a week later, Rob called me back and he said, well, Bob's out of the nursing home. I said, oh, how that happened? They said, well, he bought the nursing home and let himself out. <laughs> you can guess you own it, you can leave when you want to. I said, okay, so uh, I'll go see him at his house someday. Bob died. Like we all will. If the Lord doesn't return. I waited about three months and I called one of his cronies, Bill William. I said, William? Um I wonder what happened to all that money that Bob had. He said, I don't know. He said, he might call his nephew. I knew his nephew. So I thought, you know, surely they've set up a foundation of some sort and I'd be happy to, to if he'll help us out some. So I called him and I asked him. I said, uh, Ken, he didn't answer when I called. About three days later, he called me back. We talked a few minutes. I said, I just wondered. I told him about our work and I said, uh, I don't know, but, but Bob was always kind to me, and, and as you know, wasn't kind to many people. He's kind to me, and I, maybe maybe that would be a good place for some. Where, where's his money going? Maybe that would be a good place. Maybe you could help us out. And he said, well, there's a problem. I said, oh, and then he said, well, he left all his money to his dog. His dog. I said, Really? He said, yeah, the bad, bad thing is not his dog, it's his neighbor's dog. I thought, man, I wish I was that neighbor. <laughs> it's the neighbor's dog. And he said, there's another problem. He says, we're having a hard time finding the money. He, he left uh, $5 million to the neighbor's dog. He said, uh, we're about uh, $4,900,000 short of coming up for the money. I said, really? He said, well, he started telling stories years ago. And the stories got bigger and bigger, and all the stuff you've heard is not true. He wasn't worth very much. Now, whether he was or not, I don't know. His nephew may be lying to me. He may have worth too big. I don't know. But I do know you're intrigued by that story, weren't you? It's more interesting. You know why? Money. People talk about money. It's hard not to love money. The love of money is the root of all kinds of no good, all kinds of evil. How do you measure success? We do it by money, don't we? How much a person makes, what kind of car they drive, what kind of house they live in, how much they got. That's how we measure success, folks. Noah preached for over a hundred years. Didn't baptize anybody. Maybe converted his family, but at least made it a large. We'd fire him. Wouldn't we? He's not very 
talent. But Stephen, I don't have one sermon the man recorded. When I have the whole sermon, about halfway through it or some point in it, they started picking up stalls and going at the floor. He wouldn't make it on the front cover of any magazine of today's most successful ministers. Paul, a group of men got together and said, we're not going to eat or drink until we get them dead. Another group came together and stoned them and left them for dead. Our measure of success and God's measure of success are two completely different things. Mm -hmm. Go into all the world to preach the gospel. That's our mission. My dad preached for 44 years at the Woodline Roebuck Parkway Church of Christ in Birmingham, Alabama. And in 44 years, for 44 years, that congregation average baptizing one person every week for 44 years. In a sense, that's not that many. But in another sense, that's a whole lot. If you're baptized 50 people. So I, I, I tried to learn from that. So what I want to do in this session is I want to give you Ten keys to effective evangelism. I went to the Jerry A. Jenkins School of Evangelism. And I want to tell you ten lessons I learned from him about how to teach people. Ten points. Ready? And we don't, I don't know how long this will last, but it may last till midnight. But I don't think it will. Number one, Dad taught me that the most important key to being effective in reaching people who are lost, the most important thing is consistency. Consistency. If you want to teach lost people, you got to stick at it. you got to stick with it. It's difficult to. And all something else will come up, you'll get busy with something, you'll start studying something. Your schedule will get overly wrong. You won't be successful with a few people and before too long you're no longer doing it. Paul wrote, it's required of a steward that a man be found faithful. It's consistency. If you want to reach more people for Jesus, stop basing your effectiveness on how many people you baptize. Based on how many people you plant to see. Uh, the word will not return void. That's what Isaiah wrote through inspiration. It will serve the purpose that God sent it out to. Paul. Just be consistent. Stick with it. Number two, when you go to study the gospel with someone, take someone with you. Take someone with you. This one goes with point number one. That's why I put it right beside. That always told me the hardest thing is getting up and going. We'll find every excuse in the world. We'll find all sorts of reasons not to go. You're tired. You've got too much to do. You've worked hard all week. You need a night off. You need to spend time with your family. You can find every reason in the world. There are bad reasons. But he said, if you've already con contracted with somebody to go with you, then you've got to go. Takes with it. He said, the process, you teach someone else how to teach somebody the gospel. Takes them with you. And he told me this. He said, I've found that if I can have four people, four people in our congregation, that are teaching the gospel on a regular basis to someone, we can baptize 50 people. We want to think, we got to do an evangelism program. How many folks worship here in Delbertville? 200, 300? 200 people. We get everybody involved in it. Well, great. 
Good. Everybody has some role in evangelism. But I want to tell you, you can get four or five folks here excited about teaching lost people and then consistently get them going out and teaching people. You will have tremendous success, more than you will have than if you have 200 people involved in a happy life. Consistency. And takes on with you. Number three. <coughs> Make a list. Well, I went to the hotel before I came and I changed shirts and I didn't put my list back in my pocket. My list goes with my own server where I go. Make a list. I keep three names on a list. It goes with my own server where I go. Three people who are not Christians that I would study with or that I am studying And every day, at least once, most often two or three times, I will pray for those individuals. And that keeps me alert as to opportunities to teach them. It keeps their name before God and it keeps their name before me. Twenty-five years ago, I preached a sermon. I gave a little business side card, size card, out to everybody in the office. And I said, you need to make a list. Put three names on it of people who are Christians that you want to teach. And like most sermons, I kind of forgot about it. I did. I hadn't thought about it for years. And then one day, my son Andrew called me from football practice and said, Dad, can you meet me at the church building? I said, yeah, I'm already here. He said, I said, what's going on? He said, and he stopped for a long time, especially for a 16-year-old boy who likes to talk. I could hear him. The voice of all choked up in the background. He was crying. He said, Denny wants to be baptized. And he's my number three. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you remember about four or five years ago, you gave everybody a card and had us write three names on it and put it in our wallet and our purse and carry it with us. He said, baptized Jonathan last year and earlier this year I baptized Victor then he's my number three can I encourage you to start praying for people who are lost that you know find people that you know that are lost and start praying for them and looking then for opportunities to teach people who are lost it's one thing to, to uh to say, well, we'll reach lost people. Tell those people I have some skin on them, it doesn't really mean anything, does it? Tell them somebody we're invested in and invested in, we really don't say a whole lot. Find somebody that's lost and start working with them. One of our challenges that we're experiencing, if I can be a little, a little judgmental here, please forgive me for this. I don't want to talk bad about the church. One of the challenges we have is we have become somewhat of a cloistered community. We've become uh, somewhat of a convent, you know, where we have our little Church of Christ groups. We have our little groups that get together and we homeschool all our kids because the kids don't need to be taught to be taught out there in the big old bad world. When we get together and eat, we get together only with Christians. We have our little Boy Scout groups and our Christian Boy Scout groups. And we have our little everything's with other Christians. I know what Paul said, evil communication, corrupt good morals, good manners. I know he said you can spend too much time with bad people to start being like bad people. But he also said that the only way for us to get away from this world, uh, to get away from evil, is to get out of this world. And that we're left in this world for a reason. To be salt. You know what Jesus said? You're salt. If the salt is lost, it's flavor, it's saltiness, it's it's full. It's no longer good. It'll be thrown out. Are we salt anymore? 
Who do we know that we're teaching this lost? Keep a list. I am a part of a couple of groups of people where most of them aren't Christians. And I'm part of the group only because I want to be around some people who aren't Christians. Because I want to find people to teach. I, I, I hope that doesn't sound like I'm bragging. That's not my intention. I joined the History Society in my community. Spring Hill Historical Commission. I like history, but that's not why I joined. I joined because I couldn't find a single Christian on it. I think they're out of the Christian. I coach a little league ball sometimes. I'm not doing it right now. I don't have time to do it anymore. But for years I coached a little league ball. Not because I like a little league ball. I don't like getting out in the sun and sweating. But I know that if you can reach people's kids, if you can influence their kids in some way, you'll have a chance to influence the adult. I want to be around people who are Christians. We gotta be around some people. We gotta find people. We gotta figure out how to find people who are lost and then teach them. Keep a list. Number four. Number four. In the Jerry Jenkins School of Evangelism, I learned that if you're going to study the gospel with someone, have the approach that we are learners together of the Word of God. We're learning this together. We're discovering together what God says. Flavor Yakely did a study a number of years ago. And part of that study was how the prospect views the teacher. And I don't have the numbers in front of me. You can find the book he wrote about this. But he said that the huge majority of if the prospect sees the teacher as a fellow learner, you'll convert the person much more often than if they see you as someone over them. I went to Daryl and Rita's house. Rita was not a Christian. Daryl had grown up in the church. They'd gotten married. I went to their house and I studied the gospel with them on four consecutive Thursday nights. The last night we talked about baptism. Showed them the Joel film strip videos. Afterward, we started talking about baptism. She said, I don't believe it's a sin. So I went to the Greek and showed her what the word meant, where it came from. That means immersed. She had been sprinkled. I showed her what it meant. And then she said to me, well, you're mighty smart. But I'm not that smart. I'm glad you can understand that, but I don't think I have to understand that in order to go to heaven. Cried all the way home. Because I showed off how smart I was. If you want to teach people, don't go with the attitude, I'm superior. Go with the attitude, I'm a learner of the Word of God. They might teach me something, I might teach them something. Let's open the Word of God and study it together. Learn together. Don't be a brainiac. Don't be a, a scholar that has all the answers. You don't know the answer to something, just say, I don't know the answer to that. You don't have to have an answer to it. Number five, establish Bible authority as early as possible. <coughs> the Bible is right. Keith preached to us, it's true. If you want to be effective as a person teaching other people, you've got to convince them, you've got to help them see that the Bible is the authority. If you don't do that, you're going to short circuit yourself at some point. Number six, and study with people. Use their Bible. Use their Bible. Uh, don't use uh, your Bible. Use their Bible. Sit beside them or sit across from them and have them turn the verses or have, help them turn the verses if they don't know where they are. Read it from their Bible. Use their Bible. Uh, if they don't, and you have a different translation, and you get a little confused sometimes. Use their Bible. Number seven, in studying the gospel of people, always keep the big picture in mind. Why am I here? I'm here because this person has a soul. 
because I want them to go to heaven. And a lot of times, those of us who study the gospel of people have won a lot of battles and lost the war. And so we'll win the argument on whatever the subject is, but we won't win the soul. What's the big picture? The big picture is this person needs to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. How much do those people in the day of Pentecost know? You don't know how much they knew, and I don't either. But I suspect there's an awful lot they didn't know. But what they did know is that Jesus had died for their sins, and they need to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. And you may spend months and months teaching someone, congratulations, I'm glad you did that. But if you teach them a lot of stuff that they don't become Christians, you may win some wars along the way, some argument, some discussion, but you don't win a soul. So in that study, remember the big picture. Number eight. If you're writing notes now, write the word kindly down first. Put it in brackets, parentheses, set it aside some way, but kindly don't answer a question before it's time. Don't answer a question before it's time. This was such an important lesson for me to learn. You see, what's going to happen is people are going to come along they can ask a question about uh, instrumental music. They can ask a question about uh, does the Church of Christ believe the one is going to heaven. They can ask you their favorite question about the Bible. What does the book of Revelation mean? They're going to ask you some question that's going to take you down a wormhole. And uh, I would never tell you don't answer their question. What I would tell you is don't answer the question before it's time. Kindly help them understand. You mind if we come back to that later? I, I promise you we'll talk about that, but it's all right. Let's talk about that a little later. Now figure out a way to say that in a kind way. Because what will happen if you'll get, you'll get on some argument or something that's on tangent, it's not important when it comes to the grand scheme of getting them to Christ, and you may end up not getting to the point you need to get because you answered a question before it was time to answer that question. Number nine, make the cell. Make the cell. I I started to call this this lesson uh, what people who are evangelistic can learn from marketers. But I decided not to do that. It would have taken us a different direction for this. But I'm going to take a moment and talk about what we do. We are salesmen and saleswomen. Not in the worldly sense. But we're trying to sell something. We're selling the gospel of Jesus Christ to people. Not for money, but for their soul. So remember that we're in sales. And uh, sometimes in the church, we're guilty of doing a lot of things without doing the main thing. We don't, uh, we're not a, a part of our community doing good works in our community. We're not a part of that in order that uh, we might be seen like the Simitans or the Quadras Club or the Red Hat Club. We're not a part of our community doing the things we do so that people will think, hey, those are really good people. We do want the church to have a good reputation. Acts 2 talks about that the church did in the first century. That's important. But at some point, you've got to, you got to make the sale. At some point, somebody has to talk to someone about their soul. At some point, someone has, has to ask the question, is there a reason I should not baptize you in Jesus Christ this very day for the forgiveness of your sins so you can be a simple New Testament Christian? Some folks have been asked, has asked that question. We cannot fellowship people into the church. We cannot uh, friend them into the church. You know, we're not Facebook sending out friend requests. We're selling the gospel of Jesus Christ. At some point, we've got to ask people, are you ready to be a Christian? Number 10.
Leave the door open. Leave the door open. I, I, I think oftentimes in our our evangelistic fervor and zeal, which I'm always thankful for when we have that, we've left and we've closed doors. We've got to a point where we got to a conflict or argument, and we got so strong about the <clears throat> argument and presenting what we thought was right about that argument that we closed the door. Um, I started studying the gospel with Lynn when Lynn was in sixth grade. Sixth grade. I was in sixth grade as well. On our senior trip, midnight, Lynn woke me up, came the door, and said, uh, I'm ready to be baptized. So in 30-some degree weather, we went outside in the swimming pool at the hotel where we were on our senior trip. And we got in the water, Lynn and I, and my friend Becky was there with us. Miss Evans, one of our teachers, and I baptized her. Six years. Six years. What doors are you opening now? That someday may lead to somebody coming to Christ. You know, Paul talks about this, doesn't he? One plant, one waters. But God always gives him. Leave the door open. When you end a study, leave it in such a way that somebody comes along later and studies with them will be ready to accept the gospel. Lynn's dad called me the next day, the day after we got back from our senior trip. I didn't know Lynn's dad. I met him, but I didn't know him. He said, I understand that you baptized my son. I said, yes, sir. I was young, young, young. He said, if I ever see you talking to my son again, I will take my gun that i got sitting beside me and I will shoot you. I was 17. I didn't talk to Lynn again. I was scared to death. And then 33 years later, Lynn called me. She was going through a divorce. He said, I've never forgotten what we did. How can I make things right again? And I thought, what do we do there? Well, maybe not much. I wasn't that good a teacher. Never have been that great a teacher. But we left the door open. You're studying with someone, whether it's trying to bring them back to Christ or bring them to Christ for the first time. Leave the door open. That's all I got. Hope that's useful to you in some way. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful for this time, for these people. Thank you for their love for you and their love for the gospel. I pray that you bless them in the future. I pray that you bless your church here in Ohio, that it will be stronger, and that it will continue to influence souls as it has for, for generations now. And the future will be greater than the past was. And more people will come to you thank you that your power in the gospel has not diminished or lost any of its effectiveness that we will always spread that seed wherever we go and try to help people come to Christ thank you for uh, everyone in this room today for the love for you in Jesus name we pray Amen. thank you very much